Hi, it's Steve Hargadon, and welcome to the 2017 Global Education Conference. We're in day three, hard to believe. Also hard to believe we're actually, this is not our first keynote of day three. Our first keynote was at 6 a.m. this morning. We're delighted to have representation from the Cutter Foundation International and the partners. We have Maggie Mitchell-Salem with Alan Mather and Nasser al Khori here. Welcome to all of you, and thanks for tuning on your video. Thank you so much, Steve. We're delighted to be here. Um, you know, at QFI, we really value our partnerships, and that's one of the reasons that we thought that um, co-hosting the Global Education Conference, uh, both Nasser and I, with Alan, and talking about our experiences working together uh, might be helpful or instructional to others uh, who are looking to develop relationships with um, either private sector organizations or foundations. Um, and we're going to fix our videos. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, you know, we found our relationship to be beneficial and it evolves over time. And so we thought we would talk about why we're doing what we're doing, uh, which is working together to ensure that all kids have access to quality global education experiences. Uh, which in terms of working with Chicago Public Schools uh, has meant trying to help kids connect online but also in person. And then um, perhaps also talk about what Cutter Foundation does. Uh, we're here in Doha, Cutter, so I should point that out. Uh, we're really excited to be uh, part of the Global Education Conference from another education conference called WISE, the World Innovation Summit for Education. And that's going on right now and the reason that we're all in Doha. So um, I think that's kind of my introduction to this session. Uh, I want to turn it over to Alan to say a few words about what he's doing in Chicago and why UCPS cares about global education. And then you're going to hear from Nasser. Hi there. Okay. And before um, Alan sure you do that. So just quickly, we just wanted to recognize our sponsors and supporters, which includes QFI this year. Thanks so much for that. And those of you who have been in this room before, you're familiar with the map. You know how that works. Definitely look to the left of the map. Click on the star icon. Put your notes in the chat as well. We're going to quickly back, move back to Alan, but I didn't want you to miss this because it's so fun to see where people are coming in from around the world. I'm seeing probably Guam, Nepal. Can't tell for sure. Central and South America, New Mexico, Greece. Oh, Greece, lovely. Anyway, keep those coming in the chat. Okay, now, Alan. Oh, here. Gonna get back to you. Okay. Hi. All right. Thanks. There you Steve. go. If you can, we're, we're still trying to figure out that map. If you don't mind adding uh, Doha on there, that would be. Great. I don't know if you can do that. Adding Doha where? On the map. That's where oh. we are. Yeah, well, we're past that and we go back, it's all erased anyway. So we'll just you're good. You've said it. It's now in the recording. <laughs> I didn't know if it was being like sent into a time capsule, so I just wanted to make sure that we had Recorded that. Okay, sorry, Alan. <laughs> uh, that's fine, absolutely. Um, I am Alan Mather. I'm the chief of the Office of College and Career Success in the Chicago Public School. So I get the, I have the opportunity to oversee career technical education, dual credit, dual enrollment, college enrollment, um, and persistence work, school counseling work, um, support for our incarcerated students, community schools, um, computer science just social and emotional learning, so many different areas, but my real passion, my real connection to the Cutter Foundation initially was around global ed. I was the principal for 10 years in the Chicago Public Schools and started the first Arabic program in Chicago that is now, we believe, the United States' largest non-heritage Arabic program. Um, I think that's right. So it, We do, uh, too. We do, too. So... Um, had just incredible opportunities throughout the years to connect with students um, in the Middle East and North Africa and Qatar specifically. Um, it is, we'll, we'll talk more about later, but it's really provided our students just kind of opened their eyes 
in, in really wonderful ways. Nasser? Uh, yes, hi. Uh, my name is Nasser Khouri. I'm in charge of partnerships at K-12 Education um, at Buffett Foundation. I, um, I work closely with Maggie, and uh, previously I was part of q and I still am. Um, I'm based in Doha, and um, I was part of the very uh, planning of the, of the exchange mm. with, the, with the Chicago um, Lim Bloom Academy, and where Alan was previously. And uh, we were, you know, I was part of the planning um, team that planned that, uh, the, the exchange trip to Doha, where we brought American students from the Lim Bloom Academy. How many did we have? 30? Oh, over the years, many, but that first yeah. time we had about 20 students, five teachers, and then we brought students back fairly regularly for the yeah. and, debates. And we connected them to uh, about 30 students in, in public schools here, um, and they spent the week together just going around Doha doing different activities. Uh, one trip was focused on uh, environmental uh, Water issues, and so they did a lot of research on 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 different, you know, um, um, just water and mangroves, and and looking at mangroves here in Qatar, um, and uh, and so yeah, so now I'm in charge of partnerships at you know QF, Qatar Foundation, and um, so that's what I'm doing now. Um, yeah. Um, so I just wanted to jump in and say that one of my favorite stories from that trip. To, and sorry, Nasser, we're trying to, we're struggling uh, okay. with getting okay. everybody okay. into our. <laughs> Coming together. <laughs> so, um, one of my favorite stories from the trip uh, to Chicago started long before the trip. So, you know, as much as people think that Qatar is a small country with lots of resources, you know, we realized early on at QFI that we were never going to be able to put every kid that wanted to explore the Middle East on a plane to go to the Middle East. So we sort of came into the virtual education, sorry, virtual exchange movement early on, 2008, 2009. And we recognized that this was a great opportunity to focus on educational um, classroom to classroom uh, exchanges so that teachers and students could learn from each other. A lot of the same challenges, a lot of the same interests, um, but in different parts of the world, and that offered an opportunity to learn as well. And what I loved was the story of the kids connecting for the first time, and the kids in a classroom in Doha and the kids in Chicago. And, you know, we had set up some conversation questions, some icebreakers, and the kids immediately started, like I think at one point somebody went up to the screen with their phone. They were trying to share a game that they were playing and wanted to know if the other kids liked that game too. And it was just such a cool thing to see the kids um, ignore us and all these different icebreaker questions and start asking each other questions that kids ask each other. Um, some of them have something to do with education, most of them don't, and that's fine, because it gave them a chance to get to know each other and realize that they had a lot in common. Um, so that was just kind of neat. I and, I, and I think the other part that really brought people together initially was music. Yeah. You know, oh my students God, yeah. singing, <laughs> students sharing music, and it's just a way to break down barriers early on was really... Um, this the sharing of their knowledge of popular music and we yeah. were able to move into so many areas because of that. We there's a photo we still have in the office um, on a bus trip and I don't know if it was the Lindblom kids or kids from DC or Portland, Oregon, but the um, a girl has one of the earbuds in her ear and the guy sitting next to her and uh, who may have been Cuttery, the girl was American, um, has one in his ear. And they're both smiling, listening to the same music, and there's a kid hanging over the bus seat, enjoying the whole experience, too. It was, uh, yeah, it's one of my favorites. So, uh, I don't know. I'm not sure if anybody has any questions. And they'd be welcome to ask questions. I see there's a chat box down here. Mm -hmm. um, but what I'd also do is say, um, you know, our focus at QFI, just to give you a little background on us, is... Arabic language and Arab culture. Uh, we've also been working on 
STEAM, so STEM education plus the arts, and that's what connected us to Lindblom initially, uh, because Lindblom is a math and science magnet school and had a great Arabic program, and we thought that that was a natural alignment. And then the youth engagement program area, which really focuses on quality exchanges, virtual and actual, between young people. And for us, Arabic and Arab culture are a bridge between communities. Um, it's a way for someone to see. When you study a language, you study a people. Um, when you learn something more than how to say things, you learn something about why people do things the way they do it, why they um, believe, uh, you know, in, you know, whether it's a, a religion or a set of historical experiences or um, just different cultural nuances, why that is important to them and how there are actually sometimes some incredible overlaps that you don't even know because we often judge each other by headlines. And when you're dealing with the Arabic language, obviously the headlines aren't always very good. And so when we've built our partnerships, we've looked for communities that were looking to get beyond the headlines. And that's often really hard. And it's about building trust and um, a sense of global community. And that's what we look for in the partnerships, and that's why we think global education matters. And just how we've connected students, I mean, some of the, the key ways that we've done that that have been most meaningful, I think. I mean, that, that first trip was rolling around water issues. And so, you know, Cutter has Texas A&M, um, an engineering lab. We, we were able to, to take water samples with Cutter students. We were able but to discuss the water issues that exist both in Qatar but also in Chicago and how they could address, how could they, they could help one another address the water issues that exist in, e in each place. And eventually, and so you, there, was, there was live work that happened person to person here, but that work continued after students separated, right? So it was, um, there were virtual platforms where they made films together and eventually presented yeah. at the DC Environmental Film Festival. That was so great. It was, it really was. Um, but there are so many ways to connect students that are meaningful. I mean, one of the other things I get to um, oversee right now is, is the competency-based work in Chicago. And competency-based work is really about how you apply the knowledge that you've learned. And I saw one of the questions that came up was how do you work with um, issues of the time zones being so different. When students care about what's happening, you can find ways to connect to them. So, uh, we always had students who wrote plays. We worked with a, a, a group in Chicago that had artists in the Middle East and North Africa. And students wrote plays in our Arabic classes in Arabic. The students in the Arab world wrote plays in English um, around specific issues that uh, they were having. And they had artists who helped them with those. And then they switched the plays and performed the plays for one another. Yeah. And what that did was it got students to talk about what they understood about language and culture, what they, what the connections were, what the differences were, and how to bridge those. And it's because there was a real audience, because there was the application of their knowledge through something that was really meaningful, students embraced that, took it on, and said, yes, this is something we want to do more of. And um, just last week, I went to my old high school, and I saw students continuing that. And just the, the Snapchat, you know, their Snapchat uh, little ghosts that they were holding up to the screen so they could start following one another um, to keep those connections going was so important. Thanks, Alan. Now, sir, I, I have to ask because, um, so Alan mentioned Texas A&M and um, Nasser studied at Carnegie Mellon University, which also has a campus in Doha. And I have to ask you, because you did both the actual but also virtual exchanges with our kids, mm -hmm. um, I joke that we're responsible for shaving off um, a bit of Nasser's GPA by working him so hard <laughs> as an intern with us at Carnegie Mellon. Uh, so Nasser was actually actively engaged in uh, virtual and actu actual exchanges. Um, but what did you see when you watched Cuttery students and non cuttery students, because there's such a huge international community here. What yeah. did you see? What, what did you see them get out of it? And um, so, so I would say, like, the, the first thing that I was shocked 
um, when we did the first exchange and something that I saw and noticed is that in, in, in the first couple of seconds, students were able to find something in common with each other. And these students came from like different parts of the world. They, they've never met or spoken or, or talked to each other before, but there's always something. There's always like music or, or you know, if it's, it's, it's films or shows or, you know, with the girls it's makeup or whatever, but there's always hey. that one thing. Uh, you know, uh, we're actually deep. <laughs> there's always a connection. And, uh, and what I, you know, what I want to say here is that there's, there's always more in common than, than, you know, the differences. Yeah. And that to me was shocking. And, um, and, and that's great, to be honest. And, and once students connect, um, to see them being sort of connected afterwards and after trips, and you know, being friends on Facebook and messaging each other and, and writing on each other's walls and and doing, you know, seeing them being, you know, in touch like two or three years down the line, that is amazing because that's like, a, you know, one time. You know, we always talk about like a, a physical exchange and you know how students come and leave. But seeing them sort of interacting and uh, being in touch, you know, two years, three years down the line really, you know, makes me kind of yeah. proud because it's not just a one-time trip that we created and, and, and that's it, you know. Students are um, are engaged in online, you know, virtual, you know, programs afterwards. Like Alan said, there was a lot of, you know, after the, the, the Chicago kids came to Doha, uh, there was a lot of, you know, um, and, and did some research on water and, and you know, and, and, and with Texas a &M. There was a lot of work done afterwards. Um, and, you know, online students shared information. They did research, you know, in Chicago and in Doha. Students, you know, shared information together. They presented online together and, find, you know, their findings. And so that, that to me was, was, was really interesting. And... Um, and I don't know how much you know about, you know, uh, Education City and, and the project, and this is kind of, you know, moving the conversation away from, from you know, what we're I don't think it about. is, actually, because and, uh, it's quality global education. I mean, and, and Cutter Foundation is one of the probably grandest um, examples of how that happened. It was really, I mean, you're going to say this, so I'm going to steal your line, but <laughs> Cutter Foundation was started as, a way to develop the human capacity of not just Qatar. Qatar is a small country, and there was a recognition that to create this kind of vision, you're creating a vision for a region, um, minimally for a region, not just the countries around Qatar, but the entire Middle East. Uh, but you're also looking at how the assets of a country that has natural wealth can be deployed to ensure, like you were saying about how a physical exchange endured years later, to create that kind of long-term return on investment. Mm -hmm. And the leadership recognized in 1995 that the way to do that was to build a world-class global university. Uh, not everybody has the ability to do that, and Qatar did, uh, mobilizing resources from around the world in order to make it happen. And it was really quite incredible and not easy. And Anyway, I'm, I'm stealing. You know, no, 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 no. <laughs> you, you said it perfectly, and um, and I just I'm I'm just gonna you know kind of share um, the concept of education yeah. today. And so we have branch campuses from you know top universities in the U.S. and and U U.K. as well. Um, so we have a Georgetown campus, uh, School of Foreign uh, Foreign Service Foreign Affairs. Um, Carnegie Mellon, where I went to school, has a computer science uh, major and also a business school. Um, Texas A&M offers engineering, and it's, you know, all the engineering majors. Uh, we have a Virginia Commonwealth, BCU, that offers design and arts uh, degrees in, in, in those fields. Um, Northwestern offers journalism uh, degrees and, and other, you know, degrees mm -hmm. as well. So those are some of the, you know, the, the branch campuses that we have in Doha, and and they're all part of the Education City um, campus, which, you know, they're all right next to each other. And the really unique thing about Education City, and I don't think this exists anywhere, is that students in, for example, let's say Carnegie Mellon, uh, Qatar, can cross-register and take courses at Georgetown. And students at Georgetown yeah. can cross-register and take courses at Northwestern, for example. So this is kind of unique and, and gives, you know, students an opportunity to, 
to sort of, you know, um, look beyond sort of their major, you know, and, and look at other, you know, sort of, um, not degrees, but like other sort of uh, interests. For example, if I'm an engineer interested in arts, I can take a course in, you know, arts at VCU. So that that is really unique, and, and that's interesting. Um, and to be honest, um, answering Lucy Gray's question, uh, we have a very international uh, student body at Education City. A lot of students come from um, on, on, on financial aid from a lot of you know countries in the region. Um, so, you know we have students coming from Gaza from on financial aid, and um, we have a lot of students coming from you know Asia, Pakistan, India. Uh, so you know a lot of countries that you know students you know come from. Um, so the student body is really international. We also have a lot of uh, students from the main campuses in, in the U.S. that get to do, a, you know, um, that, you know, come for a year um, or a semester um, and study abroad here in Doha and vice versa as well. We have, you know, students from the campuses here um, have an opportunity to go to the main campus in the U.S. and do a semester or a year as well. So that's sort of, you know, education city in a nutshell. Um, I'm a project of Qatar Foundation. I went to Carnegie Mellon, as I said earlier, um, in Qatar. And, um, and so I ended up working for uh, Qatar Foundation and I work closely with QFI. And um, yeah, is that another question? Mm -hmm. So the, the picture I hope you can see is four of my students um, oh, yeah. who, who came to, to Qatar to, uh, to, to meet with students and do debate in the Doha debates. But I, I want to hit the question that I touched on and then avoided um, conveniently about how we are bridging kind of the time divide since that came up again. It is not that difficult. When students care about something, we were able to get students into our schools early in the morning, um, 7 to 8 a.m., and then the, the students in the schools in Qatar um, were able to stay a little later than normal. But because we had specific dates for them to meet and talk around specific issues, um, there was never an issue truly with, with getting students to do that early or late. Yeah, technology actually was an issue. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, that, yeah that, that was your That's true. Uh, but the students always showed up, and, and they were always there. No, I think the as long as they had something meaningful to work on, I mean, we talk about what works and what doesn't work. I mean, I think we tried at times with different places to put students in front of a screen and say, talk about this. Here, here, here's the topic for you. And, and that generally never went anywhere. But when there was preparation, when students knew specifically what they were going to be doing, thought really concretely about issues that both sides were working on and, and worked either in a collaboration or cooperation um, environment. Really <laughs> cooperation. Yeah, uh, that's uh, robotics. Uh, <laughs> it's cooperation. Um, then, then it was it was something we were always able to do. Students were able to talk to one another to make those connections much more quickly. Yeah. Um, so we're we're just making sure that we're answering everybody's questions. Uh, so if you do have questions, you can put yeah. them in the chat, and and we will uh, try to look at them. We weren't so good early on, but we're getting better. I, I think <laughs> by the end of this hour, we're going to be like pros. Um, so. When I think about Cutter Foundation, and I was glad that Nasser talked about the different campuses. Um, and for those of you, uh, can you type the, yeah, the yeah. address, the um, email address? Not email, sorry. The of, uh, QF, yeah. uh, not email. Yeah, the QF URL. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, the URL. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm so yeah. old. I don't <laughs> Yeah, yeah, website. That would be the thing that we're talking about. We're sending you um, Cutter Foundation's website. So that's there, and then do you mention it in QFI? Yeah. Just so that. Um, so, and I'm also stepping in QFI's website, um, which is. QFI.org, perfect. Yeah. So you should have that. And then. Um, can you do um, Arabic almost org too? Sorry. And we're doing, thank you, Lucy, for sharing the whys uh, information. And uh, just so everybody knows uh, who might have joined after our introduction, mm -hmm. but we are ArabicalMustard.org, yeah. One word. Okay. 
and then icebeakarabic.com. So we're sending you, we're sharing with you a couple of sites that you can use to check out. Ellen, do you want us to include any sites for CPS? cps.edu or lindbloomeagles.org, my old high school where they have the I speak Arabic. Yeah, we'll share all of those. Um, those oh. ideas. Excellent. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Dot edu? Oh, yeah. Uh, sorry, ignore cps.org. Yeah. It's, oh. it's actually cps. Dot uh, so it's okay. Edu. What's the relationship? Edu. What's so the relationship? the yeah. question about from Lucy. Um, so Kiopa is a member of Qatar Foundation. So is Wise. So Qatar Foundation, as an you know, as a foundation, has a lot of other entities and mem you know members of of the foundation under its umbrella. So Kiopa is one. Wise is another. And we work closely with Wise. Uh, we bring some you know. We actually this year we have. Mm -hmm. And Alan can tell you, or Maggie can tell you more about, you know, our kind of contribution to WISE this year. But normally what we do is with that, we work with WISE and we bring sort of some of our, you know, our, you know, from the QFIs network, we bring some of our administrators uh, from the U.S., Brazil, uh, the U.K. to Doha and uh, connect them with Qatari uh, school administrators here uh, in Qatar. So this year we have a group of... Uh, 12? 12 that are... You know. Actually, I think we have a group of 20 because things get a little crazy with us. We, we like to invite people to Doha, and it just there's a lot of conversations going on here that we thought um, other people would benefit from. But, yeah, I think we have 12 school leaders uh, and uh, about three or four organization, educational organization leaders, and then a couple others that are focused on um, projects ranging from refugee education, uh, to uh, global education and ways of building school networks globally. Uh, so, oh, what are the future plans? Sorry, I'm answering a question. What are the future plans for QFI in the U.S.? Anything on the horizon are you expanding to other school districts? Um, well, we do have future plans. We uh, expand our Arabic program, that's our signature program, Arabic language and Arab culture, to uh, schools across the U.S. We've been doing this for nine years, almost nine years. And we work in partnership with public and public charter schools. And generally, we are exploring opportunities where a school has a vision for how they can make a program sustainable uh, so that the program can come off of our funding and be fully owned I mean, it's owned from the beginning, but fully operated by the school district that we're partnering with um, so that it remains there 10, 20 years after we stop funding. That's really important to us. It's important to us that communities feel that this is a program that they want and need. So because we've had the good fortune to be well established in this area and highly regarded, which is um, a credit to the amazing team at QFI uh, that you'll see if you go to the team section of QFI.org. Um, we actually are asked throughout the year to consider different partnership opportunities with school districts in the U.S. What we loved about Lindblom and CPS is that they already had this incredibly visionary, robust Arabic and Chinese program uh, at CPS. And it was a terrific ecosystem to work in on other shared interests like science and technology. Uh, in other school districts, there is a need to integrate refugees who may come from Arabic-speaking countries. And that's been a new phenomenon in the U.S. of the past five or six years. And, you know, I'm going to give a shout out to the Austin Independent School District, which has been really terrific about seeing language as we do as a bridge between this new community and existing communities. So we think that's terrific. Um, so that's our plan is to keep finding organic opportunities, ways of connecting, because we find that that's better than us simply coming in and saying, we have this program and you should take this program. Uh, we prefer when others look at us and say, hey, we've got a lot of shared interests and we have a shared vision for what we want to see our students accomplish at the end of three, four, five years of studying Arabic. And I think about the, the connections there that where you had um, 
cutter um, that was focusing very heavily on STEM education. We were focusing on STEM education. And language and culture was a place to intertwine those so the students could actually build their academic skills within that while building cultural understanding um, in a way that was so, so needed. I mean, I think about the first student we had who um, went to the Middle East and came back and we had a, our mayor at the time, Mayor Daly, had um, 50 mayors from the Middle East and North Africa show up at, um, at our school because of our Arabic program, took, took a tour, and then had a press conference. And one of the reporters said um, to a student, you know, what, what did you get out of that? Well, we got out of it that, that they're just like us. And you people in the media, you always try to make <laughs> them say that they're this way. And, you know, and that's not true. And it was, it was, while we had the academic bent, we also had this cultural bent. The first student we had come to um, the Qatar debates and they walked in yeah. and a, a student from Iraq came up and jokingly said, you know, I'm from Iraq, don't worry, I'm not a terrorist. And, and the student said, and I'm from Chicago and I won't shoot you. And, and they, <laughs> they started a relationship based on misconceptions, right, and being able yeah. to break those down immediately and just how beautiful that was. Students can can do that. But finding your shared interests first is so important. Um, um, thank you. Uh, I'm going to look at, I'm going to take this question. Uh, are there opportunities for collaboration with nonprofits that work with middle and high school students during after school time? So um, in terms of, I'll, I'll take this from, I guess this is the question for us at QFI. Um, we, so again, our program areas are Arabic language and Arab culture, um, and STEM education plus the arts and youth engagement. In the youth engagement area, there's been more opportunity for out of school, either before or after um, activities. We are really focused in terms of Arabic language and Arab culture on in-school activities. So whether that is supporting an actual in-school program, uh, be it funding for the program itself, or support for resource development, or support for a teacher's ongoing professional development. Um, we focus on all of that in school. And for Arab culture, we look at ways, and we define Arab culture really broadly. So we're talking history, um, anthropology, all aspects of understanding a region better. That's probably the best shorthand. And for Arab culture, again, we're looking at informing um, teaching in school. Now, again, youth engagement has been, for us, a lot about virtual and physical exchange, as you've been hearing, uh, more so the physical, I'm sorry, more so, more so the virtual, because we see that as having um, more benefit for more students. Again, we can't put every kid who wants to go to Doha on a plane. Um, I wish we could, but we oh, can't. Yeah. Or, yeah, or even every student in Doha on a plane to the U.S. for a quality educational experience. Nasser's right. So how do we do this in a way that is user-friendly for teachers, um, impactful for students? And that's not always easy, I know. Teachers have a lot to do. and. We have just found that virtual exchanges, to come back to that, help foster opportunities for kids to really start building those connections that hopefully they get to um, see through in person, whether in high school or perhaps in a college exchange experience. And, you know, going back to Alan's point, the kids are getting beyond misperceptions. And you can do that online. It just has to be a well-managed experience. I would say for those looking for that after-school opportunity to check out programs that other organizations like Global Nomads, um, Solia, if you go to the Aspen Institute's Stevens Initiative, and we'll send all of this information in the chat room, uh, you'll find listings of different organizations that help connect classrooms, again, whether in school or after school, so that they can enjoy that kind of cross-cultural experience virtually. And I'm going to type that now. I'm going to turn back to Nasser and Alan. Maybe that will help. 
Thank you, another question. No, I think that I think using or tech for exchanges seems like account. a natural partnership, and it is. I mean, it, there, you know, this is one of the advantages we have now that we never had before. I mean, being able to have screens up where students are talking to one another, having strong dialogues, again, about specific things, not just talk to each other, <laughs> has, uh, has been, yeah, I mean, this technology has made this possible in ways that it absolutely never was before. I don't know if, uh, I think of all kinds of technologies that we've used, but some of them are cheap, right? We've got that from, uh, uh, from from just getting on Skype um, and having those dialogues to to more integrated and um, really targeted platforms. It's www.aspeninstitute.org. Yeah, somebody talked to them. Oh, they've got Aspen. Okay, great. Oh, thank you. Uh, I appreciate whoever did that. Lucy, thank thanks, Lucy. Um, oh, Global Kids. Yeah. Oh, Global Kids is great. Hi. <laughs> Yeah, I know, them. that's terrific. Yeah, if anybody knows any other um, organizations that are working on virtual exchanges, please share it in the chat room. There's a lot of good groups out there. Um, I, I've got to give a shout out to One World Now in Seattle. I don't know if anybody is here from Seattle, um, but One World Now does a great job of helping kids with after school. So again, ah, I'm so glad I remembered this. Uh, for the question about after school, do check out OneWorldNow.org. Uh, uh, they're really amazing. Uh, they're very Seattle focused. Uh, they're trying to move beyond Seattle. But I think you're going to find instances of organizations like them elsewhere. There's also, what's in New York? The one that we know and like in New York. Um, Sumi, you know what I'm talking about. I know Sumi is on from, uh, shout out to Sumi at QFI in D.C. Um, the, there's an organization in New York that works on after-school language programs, and I think Sumi, hi, Sumi, thank you. No, not Iron, yeah. Lucy. Iron's another really good one. Well, Iron is a, is, has a partnership with the Rota, which is another QFI. Uh, yeah, Reach Out to Asia. Oh, GLP. That's yeah. right, Global Language Program. Sumi, can you share that? Oh, perfect. She's way ahead of me as usual. Um, can you share that website? In city asynchronous collaboration. Yeah. Yeah, we used asynchronous collaborations around the, the creating of the films, around the environmental issues, around the issues yeah. of water, and that that was really helpful. So there's there's oceans for that. Oceans for Life. I don't know if Oceans for Life still exists, though. But there may be local organizations, too. I mean, in, in Chicago, we have um, Global Voices that does the work around playwriting, and they have people in different parts of the world so that um, they can help students write plays in English, and they can, uh, at least in Chicago, they help us write plays in, in other languages to be able to begin those dialogues. So yeah. th there may be local organizations to find two that you don't even know about yet. Yeah. Thank you. I'm choking. I'm, I'm not sure if anybody has any more questions. We're going to like keep the session open for another minute or two, um, see if we get any other questions. Uh, thanks for sharing links, everybody. I appreciate that. Global Voices. That's great. Thanks, Lucy, as usual. Lucy, I'm not sure. I think there are a couple of Global Voices. That may be the one in Chicago. It may not be. <laughs> I'm not certain. That's the website. You're welcome, Shiva. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. If you have any other questions. Um, oh, wait, there's questions. Okay. Oh, sure. Thank you. I'm going to... <laughs> okay, great guys. Give me the hard one. Um, so if you are interested in looking at opportunities with QFI, again, we have some very focused program areas. And in fact, we're focusing more and more, especially given the need, on Arabic language and Arab culture. Again, we focus K-12. Um, we also help teachers uh, get access to quality learning experiences either through us or um, attend conferences that are recognized and support their teaching. So you can go to qfi.org. There is a grants page. We're revamping our website, so that's probably going to be ready in the next couple of months. 
but the current site is pretty good, pretty functional, and you'll see how you can find out more about us there. And we welcome your interest, and thank you. Nancy, I just want to wrap up with a comment. All right. Thank you very much, everybody. Hi. Can I just wrap up with one comment, and then we'll let you go? Uh, I don't know if you saw Cindy's comment here yes. in the box, in the chat box, but I think this is why our event is useful. I'm not sure if I would call it important, but useful. There are so many people in geographically isolated parts of the world, including the U.S., and and so participating in something like what we're doing today is really important because they have access to things that organizations like you offer. And uh, it just, it, I think this is the big takeaway from our conference this year for me is that people are getting access to knowledge and resources that they otherwise wouldn't. And you guys are helping to make that possible. So thank you very much. And I hope that you have a wonderful rest of your conference. And we'll be following you on Twitter. So thank you for coming, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Lucy. Thanks, Steve. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thanks, Sumi. Bye.